Welcome back to the McCowan Podcast. Dave in for Bob. And with us, our man in Chicago, who has been our man in Chicago for many, many years, George Hoffman. George, uh, you and I were chatting yesterday via text. Um, you have now been part of three generations of Wurtzes. And I guess now when you consider Danny's in charge, a fourth generation fourth, of, yeah. Wurtzes, uh, of Wurtzes that are going to run the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, how much is a, of a surprise was yesterday's announcement that uh, Rocky Wurtz had passed away? Quite a bit. You know, he was only 70 years old. I don't think he was in very good health, but it was quite a surprise to a lot of us. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting how people have talked about, you know, his epitaph. And it's such a thing that it's so complicated. Um, he breathed life back into the Blackhawks and then nearly suffocated them just a couple of years ago. Uh, but he was remarkable in that he transformed this dead franchise into a very live franchise. And Blackhawks fans owe him a great debt of gratitude for that. Uh, it's fair or not, I don't know. Uh, but I think we remember uh, recent headlines first. So uh, the headline, Rocky Wirtz embarrassed and disgraced the Chicago Blackhawks, does come to mind before Rocky Wirtz saved the Blackhawks from the ancient ways of his father and turned them into a, a mini dynasty with uh, with the three Stanley Cups in six years. How hard are Chicagoans trying to reverse that order and tell a Rocky Wirtz story from its beginning? Well, certainly, and you do remember the the last because it was last year when when Rocky Wirtz embarrassed himself at a town hall meeting by berating reporters who are asking them about the the Kyle Beach incident. Uh, and he said, it's none of your business. And from that point on, you never heard from Rocky Wirtz again. Uh, Danny Wirtz had taken over. And now they were trying to transform this franchise from one that had belittled itself through this horrible situation to where they are now, to where they were when Rocky took over. Um, all I can tell you is I, the, the one memory that I have that sticks out of Rocky Wirtz was the opening night of the 2007 season. Now, mm -hmm. Bill Wirtz had died just a month earlier. And I remember writing, I was on the air for WBBM, and I wrote this, this line, and I said, uh, while the Blackhawks are mourning the, uh, what was it? Uh, while the Blackhawks franchise is mourning, it's a new morning for Blackhawks fans. And that was really true, because that night, they held a moment of silence at the United Center, for Bill Wirtz and the fans booed and vociferously booed. And then suddenly those boos turned to chants of Rocky, Rocky. It was so surreal. Think about this, a reviled member of the Wirtz family and now his son is being cheered and he hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't hired John McDonough yet. He hadn't put the Blackhawks back on television yet. He hadn't rehired Pat Foley. That was a year later. So already Blackhawks fans were thinking anything is better than Bill Wirtz. What was he like, George? Very jovial, a very personable guy. Uh, you know, it, it was pretty obvious that he was pressing all the right buttons. You have to understand back in 2004, Sports Illustrated listed them as the worst professional franchise in North America. By 2010, they were the best franchise in North America. So it was like the reverse of Murphy's Law, John. Everything that could go right did. And Rocky got a lot of credit for that. You know, the hiring of John McDonough, the, the games back on television, uh, bringing back Bobby Hull and Stan Makita, who were banished by, by Bill Wirtz. All of those things. And then you had Jonathan Taves, mm -hmm. Patrick Kane, and three Stanley Cups. So everybody loved Rocky Wirtz, and he was very personable. I remember interviewing him for his book. Um, I want to remember, is that Breakaway or Breakthrough? I forgot the name of it. A very dark book, by the way, of his upbringing by Bill Wirtz. But he was just that kind of guy. And then all of a sudden, when this situation came out, he became very crusty. And in the end, um, basically kind of pushed aside, like, Rocky, you need to go. Uh, I want to try again to, to to ask how Chicago is is uh, is handling this, if if you will. Um, there was the ill-conceived, horribly 
conducted press conference um, in, in the wake of what we now know as the Kyle Beach scandal and Rocky apologized. Is it is it fair to ask if Chicago accepted it? That's a good question. Um, the investigation said that he didn't know anything about it, which I tend to believe considering what John McDonough once said that, you know, he told the owner 5% of what was going on and, and he kept the rest to himself. And of course, John McDonough paid a price um, later after he was fired uh, for being very much part of all these meetings. I think today, most Blackhawk fans are remembering him for the positive. There were a lot of positives. <laughs> Three Stanley Cups makes you positive. Uh, it also took the Blackhawks Really, they were the let number five on the list of franchises in Chicago, from the Bears, the Cubs, uh, the Bulls, and the White Sox. The Blackhawks were last, and suddenly they vaulted to basically number two. The Bears are always number one. So fans remember that, uh, certainly. Uh, but I also think they hold in perspective what happened to the organization. I also think, Dave, what's happened recently with, <laughs> with them finishing first uh, in, in the draft and getting Connor Bedard, that kind of helps ease some of what's taken place. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, Blackhawks fans are looking ahead now and not behind to a future rather than a past. The, 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 the thing, uh, George, you might have a better sense of, because you, you talked about some really positive moments with this organization. Uh, you know, the drafting of Taves and Kane, uh, the return of Hull and Makita. Um, but those were, you know, I mean, I could point to Dale Talon as the the drafter, and I could point to John McDonough as the architect. Yes. Uh, so my so my question: How involved was Rocky on a day to day basis, or was was he not necessarily an absentee owner, but he, was he somebody that would let their let let his people do their jobs? That's exactly what he did, and that's why he was successful. He he was very much hands on at the beginning. He knew he didn't like what his dad's policy was and, and, and his grandfather's, which was basically not televising home games mm -hmm. um, because Bill and Arthur felt that it would take away from fans coming to the game. It was the opposite. And so he did all those things. Um, and he entrusted John McDonough, who, uh, if, if I don't know how people might remember this, John had just been the president of the Chicago Cubs, but for a number of years before that was their marketing director and is the man behind the first ever fan convention, the Cubs convention in 1984. Name me a franchise in North America that doesn't have a fan convention. That was John McDonough. So Rocky, Rocky pressed all the right buttons and then let everybody else take charge. Remember another thing, Dale Talon gets certainly a lot of credit for this, but a guy who is quietly never mentioned is Mike Smith. You remember Mike Smith? Sure. Rather avant-garde general <laughs> manager of the Blackhawks who drafted Corey Crawford, Duncan Keith, Brent Seabrook, and traded for Patrick Sharp. Not bad. Not bad at all. So you had three general managers involved in three Stanley Cups. Is there any way to describe what Wirtz was like away from the game and in the city and what he committed to the city? Well, he did. He committed to a lot of charities. Uh, I remember when the COVID came about, he and Jerry Reinsdorf, who was the chairman of the White Sox and the Bulls, and of course, they both co-owned the United Center, decided um, with three months left in the Blackhawks and Bulls season, they would pay all their employees because there were no games, you know, and, and so they, they paid their employees. He was very much involved in that part of the community. But Rocky Wirtz was also a businessman. I mean, the, 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 their liquor company, uh, real estate holdings. This is a guy who was, he really helped the Wirtz Corporation in many, many ways besides hockey. And, you know, when Bill Wirtz died, a lot of us thought that it was Peter Wirtz right. the son that was going to take over the heir apparent. So it was a stunner that it was Rocky Wirtz. And I think they chose, you know, he left it to Rocky Wirtz. Uh, to be the guy who run the Blackhawks because he felt he was a much smarter businessman. Turned out he was right. It, it has been pointed out that Bill Wirtz died just before the start of a, of a Jonathan Taves, Patrick Kane era, the, the uh, uh, Rocky Wirtz salvation era, if you will. And, and now Rocky Wirtz has died without seeing Connor Bedard play. Uh, 
in a Hawks uniform in a regular season game and Danny Wirtz is at the helm. Is this going to be tougher than the previous salvation? Oh, yeah. And the reason why is when Taves and Kane were drafted, as I mentioned, they already had in the pipe stream Crawford, Seabrook, Sharp, Keith. So this team was already had a base of some of the players that would be involved in their first Stanley Cup championship. Here, you have Bedard, and there are a few young players here, but there isn't, he's not walking into a core of, of, of potentials. There are some. I, it's going to take some time. I, I'd be very surprised if the Blackhawks were a playoff team this year. 